Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate uh, being able to give this talk. Uh, uh, it's it's such an honor to be on the uh, the, the Fulbright Fellowship. Um, it's a, an exchange that the U.S. State Department runs through the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, um, and uh, uh, they they both send U.S. citizens abroad to uh, uh, have academic exchanges for an extended period of time, and they also bring um, uh, interested people from overseas to come and study in the U.S. or, or to do something like a sabbatical. Um, so it's it's just great to be here, and, and today I'm going to talk about uh, one of the, the the tendrils of the research that I have, which is on tensor network methods, and in particular, I, I chose to focus this on uh, um, the density matrix renormalization group. And so, um, uh, thank you to my my wonderful host uh, Rex Godby, he suggested this uh, that I give this talk and, and sort of aim it towards quantum chemistry. So, so where this is going to end up is something that is hopefully um, very uh, uh, practical for, for at least some members of the audience. Um, and so I'll, I'll start off by talking about tensor networks. And, and this is essentially following this paper. So you'll notice that it's in French uh, and published in the, the Canadian Journal of Physics. Um, if you don't want to read it in French, uh, in the original French, then um, the archive copy starting on page 20 as an English translation of this. Um, uh, and this was mainly to help some students that I was doing while, while doing a postdoc in, uh, in Sherbrooke. Um, now, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about some basic operations and some basic concepts in, in tensor networks. Uh, and then I'll present the full density matrix renormalization group and then talk about two applications to, to quantum chemistry in general, and then also as an impurity solver and dynamical mean field theory. So I think that the, the first natural place to start is um, with exact diagonalization. So uh, in exact diagonalization, the Hamiltonian is represented as a very, very large object. And uh, so the uh, operator strings that are on the right would be an example of maybe one term that I would in incorporate into the Hamiltonian. And that is to say, it's not just maybe the Pauli Z operator, but it's instead a tensor product of a bunch of identity matrices and then wherever that, that Pauli Z operator sits. So if I write out one of these terms, that entire matrix, if I, if I compute out the, the Kronecker product, that'll scale as the size of the local dimension to the nth power. And so with system size, with more and more systems, then this is going to be more and more difficult to solve. It's going to scale exponentially. And, and exponentially scaling methods are very bad because it means that we're not going to get very far in, in doing them. It's a little bit better than tower exponential, but... Um, still this isn't particularly good so for example like for a spin half model d would be two and um, realistically you would only be able to get to on a laptop or on a regular computer out to five or 20 sites with current uh, 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 limitations on memory before you start introducing symmetries and things like this um, there might have been a more recent work uh, surpassing this but as of 2018 at least in, in the paper that i show um, 50 sites was the world record uh, that they claimed. Um, so this is clearly too large, too expensive for large systems. Uh, and if you don't have access to a big supercomputer with a lot of memory management, then you're not gonna even be able to hit the 50 sites. Uh, so um, clearly we should be looking for other algorithms that would scale just a little bit better while retaining the same amount of accuracy uh, as we do that. Now, the particular program that I'm going to pursue here, uh, contrast to maybe something like quantum Monte Carlo or you know, density functional theory, um, are the uses of uh, a tensor network. And so tensor networks can appear in a variety of contexts. And I just listed the sort of the three that were most immediate to me, but sort of anywhere a tensor appears, is you can claim that you can write it out as a tensor network. Um, and so the first one is the one that I'm going to be talking about, so I won't say much about it here, but that's essentially this program of using entanglement to renormalize the properties of a system and, and using um, uh, the, the density matrix to decompose the system into smaller parts. But, you know, if I wanted to write out the, 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 the connectivity of a neural network, then each of those gray nodes has a certain number of lines coming into and out of it, and that is a tensor. So machine learning can also fall under this umbrella of a tensor network. Uh, and then there's also quantum computation, which I think is somewhere else where you might see it. And this is another research specialty of mine. So if you apply an operation on the um, uh, on the on, on a network of qubits, you can write this out as a, a series of unitaries, and, and these also uh, appear as tensors in the problem. 
So um, there's clearly a lot of ways in which you can do it. Now, the things that's going to distinguish today's talk from the other two is, is that in machine learning, you're not assuming any structure of correlations. And, and here, for these quantum problems, it turns out that there's something called Cohn's nearsightedness principle, which will tell us essentially that um, uh, we should be able to um, uh, you know, have some restricted class of correlations that need to be accounted for on the, on the lattice. And then for quantum computation, there's another wrinkle to the program of tensor networks that I'm going to be talking about here and that you can perform some truncation to truncate the memory and it, not everything is unitary. Some, some tensors appear as isometries. So um, I like to start off by talking about this uh, book, which I have on my shelf back in you know, where my, my books are stored. Um, uh, and I have it on my shelf for other reasons than this, but they, they make something of a, a misidentification. Um, and so there's really two keywords in the density matrix renormalization group, this awesome tensor network algorithm, and that is density matrices and then also the renormalization group. Now in this book, um, they say that uh, the original identification with some renormalization group turned out to be mistaken. And it turns out that they, they overreached by, by saying that. Um, and then, because they sort of shoot themselves in the foot in the next couple of lines. And one of them is to say they, they throw away states where there's a maximum length scale and uh, they're actually dealing with an effective short range entangled product. Well, if you know a little bit about the renormalization group, you're essentially establishing some cutoff over which the theory is valid. And so um, they've sort of uh, undermined their own, their own statement here. So in order to explain a little bit more about uh, why this method is a renormalization group and how density matrices factor in. Let's let's talk about sort of what the general idea of a tensor network is. And instead of trying to treat the entire quantum problem as we did in exact diagonalization with uh, taking all of the spins all at once, instead of what we wanna do is we wanna break the system down into one or two or three sites, update, perform some update on those few sites and then move that uh, onto the next set of sites and then continue to do this as we move along. So the idea is, is we wanna take all of those, I think there's 10 spins or something and, re and renormalize them, that's the keyword, down to two sites is the algorithm that I'll present here. So uh, for a very, very simple problem, I can write down the wave function for a two spin half sites. And if I just write out a, a classical wave function, you know, a classical state, there's no entanglement here uh, of, the first site being up and the second site being down, then I can just rewrite that as a tensor product of two states. And if I wanted to write that out of the full basis, then I might choose a basis where this is the other representation of that wave function. Now, um, this is fine to do for classical states where you don't have some sort of uh, superposition of, of states um, to account for. Um, but the question is sort of, if we want to apply this to quantum problems, how do we then find some equivalent decomposition of these two sites in general. In other words, how do we cut those two sites apart in some very general and very systematic way? And so uh, the idea of um, sort of reducing something down to a smaller system dates back all the way to uh, Kadanoff. And, and this is sort of Kadanoff spin blocking technique that I'll just say very briefly, but if I have a lattice of spins, I can group them up into different sectors. The idea is if I've performed some clever operation to go from the left to the right, then if I solve the problem on the right, I'm dealing with a drastically reduced number of degrees of freedom. And so if I were able to sort of map all of my problems from a very large problem down to a very small problem, then this would be a, a solution strategy that would be very beneficial. And so um, in some ways we're, we're sort of recovering this uh, or, you know, this, this idea appears very robustly in, in many tensor network algorithms. Now, um, this reduced site representation needs to have some of the same properties. So the energy needs to be the same up to some accuracy. And there's other uh, properties that you can demand of the system in, in this renormalization operation. Um, but I just wanted to sort of highlight that, you know, Leo Kadanoff in the 1960s published some papers on this. And, and this is sort of the general, uh, um, this is sort of the general idea behind renormalization group in the condensed matter case. Now, um, I've sort of unfairly chosen to assign uh, Kenneth Wilson as the, the standard bearer for um, uh, particle physics, but uh, sort of the source of the uh, confusion in that, that book excerpt that I, that I showed is, is that Wilson and Kadanoff's ideas are very, very similar in terms of the renormalization group. 
So on the one hand, in what I've just presented, Gadanov's idea of renormalization group is to take a large number of degrees of freedom and then renormalize them down to a few numbers of degrees of freedom while retaining a lot of the, the physical properties of the, the reduced model. Now, I like and I analogize this on this slide to a, something like a low pass filter. Um, and so if you're thinking about trying to solve something like the many body problem, you know how to write down the Hamiltonian, but it is too big to solve. So if you could somehow change it down to something smaller and get some reasonably accurate answer, then this would be highly useful. So um, this, is, this is one way to interpret the renormalization group. The second way to interpret the renormalization group is to establish a radius of convergence. And so this, this idea is more native to particle physics. Um, in, in terms of this, there's a sort of a, a mathematical operation that you can perform. I think it shows up most in complex analysis um, where you perform some analytic continuation. And I think for this audience, analytic continuation might have a different connotation, but it can also mean that if I start off with some theory centered on, along one of those black dots and establish a radius of convergence, I can rewrite a Taylor series for anywhere inside of the, the radius of convergence. And maybe then I have a different radius of convergence, which is shown by the pink circle. But then if I continue to rewrite the theory at different points, then maybe my, my Taylor series, maybe my radius of convergence shrinks, but I still have a theory at some other point and it has some Taylor series that is analytic inside of the radius of convergence. And this is more akin to what we see in, in renormalization group applied to particle physics. So in particle physics, we don't know what the main theory is. We know that there are um, sort of energy scales that we can apply each of the theories at. And each of these energy scales is sort of bounded by some hard cutoff. So think of like a Debye frequency. And this establishes an energy range over which that theory is valid. And then what you can do is you can solve it by using perturbation theory. Now, um, these two ideas are very linked. I, I think maybe this is, you know, sort of easy to see, hopefully, from, from these two examples, but the renormalization group for the particle physicists is the operation of changing the energy scale of your theory. And the renormalization group, as it is for Kadanoff, at least in this example, is that Kadanoff is just taking the number of degrees of freedom and, and shrinking them. So these two ideas are very linked and to sort of very much underline the link between these. Ken Wilson is really the originator of all the ideas that are gonna follow in this talk. He, he didn't just contribute to these ideas on um, renormalization group for critical systems and particle physics. He also made the original numerical renormalization group, which was the um, sort of the first, uh, you know, the, the question of how to extend that to more than one site was the thing that led us to the density matrix renormalization group. So renormalization group essentially in this context is just going to mean that there is some program of operations to take a big problem and then move us down to a small problem. And in doing that, we're going to establish a radius of convergence around how entangled those states should be. And by keeping the most relevant ones, we should then be able to um, uh, find something uh, uh, that resembles a good algorithm. So in order to introduce density matrices, I think that it's best to take one step back and to take a look at the basics of information theory in order to understand, because now that we have this idea of how to take the big problem and make it into the small problem, we need to understand how to cut a lattice. So if we take the lattice and we chop it in half, how does one side communicate with the other side? And so to do that, let's go back to classical information theory and let's talk about what uh, Shannon was doing around World War II and uh, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, and that is, the, the mathematical question of if you send a message to a receiver, then how do you guarantee that the message has not been interrupted by some noise and that the content of that message has not changed? So if I get one of the letters wrong, then the word might change. And then this will generate a whole new meaning for the message in, in some cases. So the mathematical question that you can ask is, what's the uncertainty in the word that I've received? And so as a very, very simplified decoding algorithm, we can have the receiver go back to the sender and say, was the first letter A, was the first letter B, was the first letter C, on and on and on. And then was the second letter A, is the second letter B, third letter, fourth letter. And this is um, a very crude decoding algorithm, but you can ask the mathematical question of how many questions on average do I need to ask in order to ensure that the message that I received is the same as the one that was sent? And so um, there are four axioms that you can assume in order to write down whatever uncertainty function you have. 
One is that it's monotonically increasing. So more letters, there was more uncertainty in the word. The other is that it should add like a logarithm. So if I have two words that I add together, then this should be sort of like the uncertainty of all of the letters multiplied up. And that looks like a logarithm. There's also a grouping axiom, which is, um, I, I won't write down or show, but it essentially just says that if I take a part of the word and then ask what the uncertainty on that part of the word is compared to the other one, how does that connect? Um, sort of like the inverse of the second axiom. And then also that this function must be continuous. Um, now, if you want to prove exactly what uh, figure of merit applies here, it turns out that it's the entropy. So uh, this is known as the Shannon entropy classically, where the input rows of I are uh, the uncertainty in each of the letters. And in the quantum context, this takes on a completely new meaning. It's the entanglement entropy, it's the von Neumann entropy. And instead of having uncertainty in each of the letters, what we'd have is we have elements of the density matrix. Okay, so this is a major, major hint for what we're about to do. It says that anytime that I want to partition my lattice and have one side talked to the other side, if I ensure that the entanglement between the two is captured, in other words, if I ensure that the elements of the density matrix are, this, are exact, then I will have a good representation of how much information is being passed between the two. And this is a very natural concept, I think even more so on the quantum side, because if I think about a singlet and how uh, I don't know what one state is doing in terms of the other, I do know that if I measured one of the spins, I would know what the other spin is doing. And so this is sort of, what is, how, how are these two talking to each other and what are, what are the, uh, you know, the, what's the, uh, well, the entanglement between the two. So just as a little bit of a reminder about what density matrices are, here's the definition. And these density matrix uh, can be sort of ordered from greatest to least uh, uh, values. And if I then take the trace of the density matrix with some operator, this is a sort of a shorthand way to compute expectation values. And the very useful property of the density matrix is that if I truncate the smallest eigenvalues of the density matrix, it doesn't make much of a difference to the overall expectation value. So this is something that's very, very useful from the perspective of a density matrix. Now, you can't compute the density matrix without having the full wave function. So we're going to need to keep that in mind as we move into the algorithm. But this is a, a, a conceptually very nice way to design an algorithm to only keep the most relevant degrees of freedom. So this is sort of connecting with Kadanov's idea of, re, of the renormalization group. Now, um, in order to talk about how exactly to partition a lattice, then we can write down two different density matrices, one corresponding to the left side of some partition in our system and another to the right. So the one on the left can be decomposed into an eigenvalue decomposition of a uh, unitary U that contains all the basis functions for the left-hand side of the system. And then V will contain all the basis functions on the right-hand side of the system. Now, if I want to solve the left and right density matrices for the wave function, then that turns into something that's called the singular value decomposition. So anytime that I want to partition a wave function into left and right states, or you know, put some of the sites on one side and some of the sites on the other, I can perform this uh, singular value decomposition. And essentially, I'm allowed to truncate that singular value decomposition because that D matrix represents the square root of the eigenvalues of the density matrix. So by leaving off small elements of the density matrix, I'll be able to retain a good representation of my wave function without keeping the full exponentially sized Hilbert space. Now, um, in terms of basic operations, the singular value decomposition is certainly one of them that is very useful. It tells us how to go from a full wave function to something that has a site-by-site -site representation. But in order to fully understand how to sort of group the correct uh, sites together, we need to understand the second basic operation, which is the reshape. And the reshape takes two sites and it um, essentially reassigns how the basis functions are grouped together. So if I just take the elements of the vector and I reshape them into this uh, matrix, what I've done is I've assigned all the left basis states onto the rows of that matrix and all the right states are on the columns. So this is a way, so reshape, whenever I say reshaping, I just mean I'm grouping some, into some sites in the system together and other sites into the other part. So the reshape will naturally tell me sort of what the basis 
of my, my problem will be. And we'll see a very practical example of this in a second. Provided that there's the same number of elements, any tensor can be reshaped into any other tensor, so long as the same number of elements appear. So what we want to do is, as a very, at the very simple level for a, just a foresight problem, if I want to cut a lattice so that the first site is isolated from the rest, then I'll reshape into a two by eight matrix. And if I want to separate the first two sites and the last two sites from each other, then it's a four by four. And if I want to separate the, uh, um, the, the last site from the first three, then I can reshape the vector into an eight by two. And this is, is how I will be able to sort of choose my partition in the lattice. Now, going back to the singular value decomposition, just to make this a little bit more formal on our little example that we've been carrying through of a two site spin half model. If I have reshaped the wave function into the, this uh, matrix, and then I perform a singular value decomposition, I recover three terms. And the first term is a unitary that corresponds to one site. And the last term is a unitary that corresponds to the other site. And in the middle, this is the thing that's going to generalize uh, the problem to encompassing entanglement is some center of orthogonality, the, the D matrix and the singular value decomposition. And uh, just as sort of your first example of a matrix product state, the, uh, uh, the center of orthogonality can be applied to any of the two sites. So the, the MPS can be regaged in a different way. Now, um, instead of writing out a bunch of sums of operators that, that deal with these, these tensors, so every time I perform a singular value decomposition, there's this extra index that appears. And so all of the site-by-site -site, uh, uh, operators turn into tensors. So if I want to write out the first tensor here, it's a vector. And if I want to write out a rank two tensor, then it's, that's a matrix. And so it will have two lines coming out of the blob. And then if I have a rank three, uh, tensor, then it'll have three lines coming out of the blob. And the challenge question that some people ask, but I think this is a bad format to sort of test. Um, uh, if I want to write down a trace, then I can write down four tensors and then connect them where the connection represents a contraction of two indices. So just to formalize the singular value decomposition before I formalize the, the contraction operation, the singular value decomposition um, takes a tensor. You can reshape into the indices that you want to group on the left and the right. And then you perform the singular value decomposition just as you would in any other linear algebra operation because you've converted the tensor into a matrix essentially. And then you can unreshape the indices and then obtain the, the components of the singular value decomposition. Now, um, in the last two operations that, that Bear mentioned here are contraction and permutation. So permutation is very easy from the perspective of a uh, uh, you know writing things down on the paper, I can always swap indices without any consequence. On the computer, it costs some effort to copy all the values into the other tensor. Um, but if I want to perform a contraction, then I can follow these six steps, which is to say that if I identify the indices that I want to contract over that are connected, then I can permute those indices such that it looks like the contracted indices on the left or in, on the inside for the, the eventual matrix multiplication. And then if I reshape everything together, I can recover some some uh, matrix. And then if I perform my regular matrix multiplication, I can then unreshape those resulting indices and um, obtain the, the, the resulting tensor. So those four operations of contraction, decomposition, permeating, reshaping, those constitute the absolute basic operations that you need in order to implement tensor network operations. So um, let's go back to a, a wave function and then convert it into a tensor network representation called a matrix product state. And so the first step that I want to do is I want to take the, in this case, a six site model, and I want to reshape it into that the first site is isolated on one side and the rest of the sites are isolated on the other. And so this is a two by 30 matrix. And if I just write out what the, the ground state wave function is, then I can perform the singular value decomposition and then in diagrams, it appears uh, like this. And just to sort of drive home the point, this is now going to be my first MPS tensor, which is the U unitary from the, the singular value decomposition. And the size of the inner index is going to be just the minimum of the two sides that I was using here. So that's two in this case. And then the remainder is 32. So then if I move on to the next site, and I want to truncate such that I've already isolated the first site, so then I want to isolate the next site from everything else, 
then uh, I need to take that D and V matrix from the previous step, contract them together. And then uh, what I need to do is I need to perform another singular value decomposition. And this singular value decomposition will now isolate the physical index on that second site from everything else. So that's why there's now a vertical index sticking up on the, the yellow U tensor. And then uh, the dimension here is four because it's now two times two. So that's now the minimum and then the, the rest and then a dimension 16. So if I continue this program, I generate some matrix product state wave function uh, that is given here. And uh, by doing these progressive reshapes and, and singular value decompositions, and then eventually I have a site-by-site -site representation of the entire wave function. And this will allow me to perform operations on it. So just to throw some terminology at you, there's a physical index, which is pointing up vertically on these diagrams. And this corresponds to the local Hilbert space size, the local Fock space. And that for the spin F model is just of dimension two. So it's just spin up and spin down. The link indices grow exponentially in the exact MPS as you move into the center of the chain, but those link indices uh, correspond to the basis functions for every other state in the system. Now, if you're foreshadowing what's going to happen, you can truncate that representation according to the density matrix and then come up with a much, much smaller bond dimension representation of the system. So it's not, in practice, this will not actually scale exponentially. You can get away with using 45 to 100 bond dimension for a, a given system. Um, uh, and I'm mindful of the time. Uh, so the, uh, uh, so here's what the matrix product state looks like. So if you, the full wave function is given on the first line and then the second line uh, is decomposed into a series of tensors. Now, uh, just as we can decompose the wave function into a site-by-site -site representation, it's less clear how to do this in a very prescriptive way for the matrix product operator, but there is a way. I just, I think it's a little bit convoluted to explain in the, in the talk here, uh, but there is a way to decompose the Hamiltonian into a site-by-site uh, uh, representation of the problem, and that's given here. So what we want to do now is we want to apply these four basic operations onto a quantum problem and then recover the ground state out of this. So in other words, what we want to do is we want to find the ground state energy, which is given by the expectation value in the first line. And there's essentially only four, op four steps that we need to repeat in order to obtain uh, some suitable algorithm to do this. So we need to write the tensor network for only a few sites. So, so far I've only shown sort of the full MPS. We can always contract some of those down so that we only, only have two sites. We then update those tensors with a Lanczos method or a power method, but in this case, it turns out that Lanczos is a little bit better. And then we perform an SVD to uh, regauge the tensor. In other words, in order to break that tensor back into its site-by-site -site representation. And then we move on to the next site. So just to write, just to throw some diagrams, the, uh, uh, the expectation value is given in this first diagram. And if I want to variationally update two of the tensors, then I can think about that as sort of taking a derivative over those two tensors. And that gives the diagram uh, on the bottom, which is that there's only two tensors in the network that are missing. Uh, and I should just say that the, the green uh, tensors are the, basically the MPO, the, the Hamiltonian, the bottom row of tensors is the wave function, and then the tensors on top are the dual uh, wave function. So this is what the individual four steps look like in terms of diagrams. So I contract up all of those tensors down to just two sites in the first step. I apply my Lanczos algorithm. I then decompose with singular value decomposition and then update the environments and move on to the next site. So just to give a, a, a brief example of what a sweep would look like, if I move the orthogonality center incrementally, as I move down the lattice, updating the tensors each time, then I'll be able to update all of the tensors in the network as I sweep back and forth, always focusing on some local representation of the problem as I go. Um, now, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll risk the, the time to show you an example. So this is a, um, a tensor network library that I made while I was in um, uh, the, the position at Sherbrooke. Uh, it's called DMR Julia and it's on the web. It's about to get a major update and, and this talk will be sort of uh, in an archive article, probably within the next two weeks, um, uh, to be submitted. Um, but essentially, just to give you an idea of how fast this uh, algorithm will work, um, we can run the DMRG algorithm for a 100 site spin half chain. And it's only going to keep up to 45 states on those link indices. 
But essentially that entire 100 site chain is swept back and forth in two seconds. I think my computer's a little bit slower uh, because of the, the video sharing, but normally this, this step is a little bit faster. Um, but you can see that the ground state energy converges very, very quickly to what the ground state energy should be. Uh, and so this is something that's clearly outside of the realm of possibility, even on large supercomputers for exact diagonalization. Um, but you can see that it's being solved very efficiently here. Um, and then, so, you know, that only took a minute to essentially achieve a very highly accurate wave function. Um, and then it's going to uh, do the, the, the quantum number version, which is faster, but I, I think we'll, we'll skip that um, and go back, back to this. So, uh, I think the, the natural question to sort of ask at this point is why does that converge so quickly and, and why is that? And the idea is, is that it relates to something called the area law of entanglement, uh, which is something that was derived for black holes uh, by, uh, you know, when they were looking at basically what the, the radiation from a black hole was. And they noticed that the entropy of the black hole scaled like the area, essentially. So um, the uh, total Hilbert space is not necessarily to consider here. What we need to consider are only those states that follow this area law that have some local relationship. And that locality is expressed in terms of uh, the types of correlations that I can measure on the lattice. So one is if I have a gap in my eigenvalues, then those correlations will decay exponentially and that's shown by the top figure. And if I have a gapless system, in other words, there's a sort of a continuum of eigenvalues, then those correlations will decay much, much longer as a power law. And so if, if you recognize this from another context, this is just Cohn's nearsightedness principle, which is to say that physical systems tend to be uh, very locally represented. So if you're thinking about the matrix product state representation that we've derived, and I think about what, the, what one cut is, if I look at the area between two sides, that's a zero dimensional area. And so that's, that's particularly good. And so DMRG is going to work particularly well for one dimensional systems because the area between the two means that there's only so much information that needs to be passed between them. Now, if I go into two dimensions, sorry, we'll go back to that slide, but if I go into two dimensions and I think about cutting a, 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 you know, a, 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 a line along the two-dimensional guy, there's a lot more bonds that I have to cut through. There's a lot more information that's being passed between left and right. So DMRG, in terms of the matrix product operator, the matrix product operator is going to grow. DMRG will need to retain a larger sized wave function to get a good ground state fidelity. And this means that as I go into higher and higher dimensions that this will scale more and more poorly, but you should try it anyway. Um, just as an honorable mention, there's also other ansatzes of wave functions that can be imposed such as the projected entangled pair state, the, the PEPs. And then there's also the, the MIRA which captures gapless uh, correlations. So um, as promised, we'll talk a little bit about uh, quantum chemistry systems. And that is to say that if I write down what the many body Hamiltonian looks like, there's immediately sort of two issues. One is that the dimension of the problem, problem is three dimensional. So I'm now cutting sheets and I'm asking how much information is going to be passed between the sheets. And so when I perform my singular value decompositions, I'm going to have to keep a lot of the eigenvalues of the density matrix. And then when I perform uh, the actual writing of the MPO operator, the electron-electron term in the many-body problem is going to be, uh, and it should be C, I, dagger, C, J, sorry about that. Um, but the, uh, the, um, the number of terms in the matrix product operator are also going to be very large. And so this is going to sort of create two problems. And so since molecules are higher dimensional, this, this forms a bit of a problem. Having said that, you can still apply these methods on quantum chemistry systems, and this is done in certain places, but you can also use other algorithms, such as embedding theories, uh, such as, and, and, and other things in order to uh, solve for quantum chemistry systems. Now, um, just as one other example that I think will be relevant for maybe one or two people in the audience is dynamical mean field theory. And so in DMFT, one rewrites a problem into an impurity model in order to solve for the strongly correlated physics. And since there's no sign problem in tensor networks, this should have an obvious advantage over quantum Monte Carlo. And since you can do real-time evolution, that means that you won't have to analytically continue anything. Uh, and this scales better than exact diagonalization, the other popularly used uh, algorithm to solve the impurity. Um, but I would say that this is still very much a work in progress. The, the field has not um, totally overtaken those other methods yet. 
uh, with using impurity solvers for dynamic linear field theory. So um, we're coming to the end. There's probably a, a lot more to say about all of these things. Um, but uh, so the density matrix renormalization group is a very good algorithm to solve for large second quantized lattices for the ground state. Uh, it also is a very natural algorithm that encodes entanglement into it. So it's very useful for searching for topological phases because you can characterize entanglement much easier. Um, and there's applications in many areas. The, the two that I chose to focus on here were quantum chemistry and then also DMFT, um, but there are also other places. Um, a paper that contains some of, well, all of these ideas, uh, you know, but maybe in a longer format uh, is going to appear on the archive within probably by the end of this month. Um, and then uh, if you want to take a look at the code that I have, you can, you're more than welcome to look at the, the GitHub page. Uh, if you would like sort of a hands-on tutorial for this, or if you know of students that would like to participate in this, uh, I will, will be having a, a workshop that will be the week of July 26th, so coming up. Um, and of course, if you want to email me, you're, you're more than welcome. So thank you for your attention. I'd love to take any questions. As I said, there's a lot more to say, and so hopefully we can get to more of it in the questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this very nice talk about uh, about DMRG. Thank you. Um, so the floor is open for a discussion. If you have a question, please raise your virtual hand. I should be able to see it. Um, let me take the participants. Uh, I don't see any for the moment. Let me. I think Mirza had my hand up. Uh, okay, I'm probably not having the right view. Let me do it like this. Mirza has a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, so maybe a stupid question. I maybe I didn't get. Is there any uh, dependence on how you partition the system, or it will just uh, be the same? Uh, any any partition or so, theoretically, no. Um, the uh, the basis functions it, essentially when you're you're partitioning the system, you're just choosing a different basis. So, for example, when I I take a, a tensor, uh, or even here, maybe we just show a, a quick numerical example. So, so I have this tensor, uh, which is this guy, and if I then reshape it into a vector. If I were to compute the norm of this, there's no difference between the two. So essentially this reshaping operation is just changing the basis. It's just saying, instead of grouping these indices together, let's you know, move some of those indices into the other partition. However, in practice, when you actually do DMRG and you sort of have to worry about this a little bit, um, when you're truncating with a singular value decomposition, you can have a little bit of a difference. Uh, sort of, so, uh, you know, as I move along that all those operations should be exact, but if I truncate them, then I, I will get slightly different representations. So the, the, the practical way that this might appear in your problem is, is that if you're solving something at ultra low bond dimension, in other words, you're not allowing enough states to capture the entanglement in the system, then you can wind up with a different ground state or a different energy than the other one. Uh, the singular advantage of this method, however, is that the, um, the bond dimension can just be chosen sort of freely, and there are sort of automatic ways to, to determine the bond dimension. So you know, you're guaranteed to be close to the ground state answer, and, and certainly you get better as you increase the number of, okay. of states. So you could have kind of a convergent study with the dimension of the truncation to, to, to see right. whether you're getting. Okay, thank you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first there is uh, Lorenz who cannot find his hand. So uh, let him ask a yeah. question and then there is Ali. <laughs> Go ahead, Lorenz. Oh, I, I have, but not, not the virtual <laughs> one, sorry. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So nice Thomas, you. thank you very much. Uh, I have a silly question, sorry, uh, because sure. uh, it's so complicated and I, I don't know whether I grasp the, the main idea. So, Sure. If, if I go back at the beginning of your talk, there was a hint about uh, energy scales. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned uh, neglecting 
eigenvalues in the diagonal part of a singular value decomposition. That's right. My silly question is, are those two uh, concepts uh, related somehow? Yes, yes. So yes, you, you've picked up on exactly uh, the core idea. So, so very good. Uh, um, uh, so um, if I were to write out sort of what the basis function was for the element of the density matrix that I, that I chopped off, these tend to have very, very high entanglement. So the rest of the Hilbert space does not scale like the area law. The rest of the Hilbert space can scale in, in you know, something like a volume law with the entanglement. And essentially those higher entangled products have lower weights in the density matrix. So by chopping those off, I'm essentially throwing out things that are, you know, have very, very long range entanglement. And I'm keeping things that only have very short range entanglement. So the connection there between having this, um, you know, radius of convergence is that the sort of the range of entanglement is being truncated whenever I perform those those uh, singular value decompositions. Okay, so uh, just just uh, to understand um, what if I understood, so the 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 actual quantity um, we, we, which is re renormalized, if you want, is is the entanglement. It's not the energy. So, I, Sorry, because I, I, I no, can yeah, think no. in terms of energy very clearly, hopefully, yes. I don't know, but <laughs> not so clearly about entanglement. Yes. But anyway, yeah. I think I, I got something new. Thank you yeah, very much. Good. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I think uh, this sort of presentation strategy of, of presenting, you know, density matrices as information theory should probably be done more in statistical classes. It wasn't presented to me like this. Uh, but yeah, I think that that really made it clear for me is understanding that oh, the density matrix is the thing that controls the von Neumann entropy. So it's really, you know, I think the normal progression in classical physics, classical statistical physics is to do the historical thing of, oh, by the way, there's this density matrix that can then give you expectation values. But I think that the other way around is much better because normally you start with, here's the system, here's the density matrix. Oh, by the way, it gives the entanglement. But if you sort of go the other way around on it and say, well, von Neumann pointed out that the information passed between parts of the system are contained in the density matrix elements, then I think that this is a, you know, a very, it, it, that made it very clear for me what, what entanglement was doing in a system and, and why it was important there. Uh, okay, thanks again. Sure. Thank you. So first there was a question by Ali Sadegi and then Stefan. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks for the very nice presentation. Uh, actually, I have a question about the locality sure. or uh, the cone principle of uh, nearsightedness, as you told. Yes. Uh, as far as I see, uh, your approach critically depends on the locality, yeah? Uh, yes, and, that's right. Yeah, and uh, my question is that uh, how this nearsightedness uh, behavior differs in one, two, and three dimensions, perhaps. Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. good question um, uh, with a, a, an extended answer. So um, nearsightedness applies in, in, in all dimensions, essentially. Um, and, and the sort of the full ra rationale is, um, uh, is you know, the, the full reasoning is the area law of entanglement. And there's a paper in Physical Review Letters by Matt Hastings from 2004 uh, yeah, 2004, uh, where he proves this in, in second quantization. And then it, there's a, I think it's reference seven or nine or something of that paper where he says, oh, by the way, this is, this is proving Cohn's nearsightedness principle. So Cohn uh, came up with this statement to sort of justify, um, you know, why the structure of correlations appears as it does in, for density functionals and for densities in general. And, but then Hastings proof generalizes that to sort of any correlation function, one of which would be um, you know, the, the elements of the one body reduced density matrix. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the connection between, um, you know, the structure of correlations and cones near side in this principle. I just, I, I think that that's the name that would be most recognizable by, um, by this audience. Uh, and, and I think it's a cool name too. So, um, but the, the area law applies in no matter sort of what dimension you want to phrase the problem in. Now, what I will say is, is that the, um, there are area law violating Hamiltonians. In other words, their ground states don't follow the area law. 
but these are very, very contrived. They're, they tend not to be very physical Hamiltonians. And every example that we have uh, of a physical Hamiltonian tends to obey this structure of, of entanglement and correlations. So in general, the problems that you will want to solve will uh, fit this, this framework of local entangled products are the good ones to keep and, and that will give you a, a, a good resolution on your ground state. You know, you can ignore the, the higher scaling stuff that are, that are harder to capture. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Well, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stefan has a question. Yeah, hi there. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I, I also have a question related to to this locality. So in in DMFT, uh, you also do this sort of a local approximation where you say, okay, you assume that the self energy is is essentially local. So you cut off the non local right. pieces of the self and of the many body self energy. Is this related to, to, to this locality as you have it here, or is this some, some different concept? Uh, yeah, they're a little bit different. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So the self-energy is, you know, you, the, the inputs to it, you can think of as the, the frequency and, and the wave number, whatever you're looking at. And if you ignore the dependence on the wave number, um, mm. uh, then this is, this is the approximation that is made to the self-energy. Um, so... The, uh, th this program of, of renormalization and keeping these entangled products is sort of exact for any lattice you can think, uh, you know, even, even the ones that don't obey the area lot, even the ones that are scaling poorly, this, this program, this algorithm will still work. You'll just be less efficient. Um, and so people still use this algorithm on it, even though, you know, what I solved was, you know, less than a minute. It can be 30 seconds if I don't have the video streaming on. Um, but, uh, uh, it, you can apply it to a lot of different problems and it just depends on how long you want to wait, whether it's, if it's a couple of minutes, that means you're solving an easy problem. If you want to wait a couple of hours, you might be solving a harder problem. Now, um, the points where DMFT becomes exact are when the coordination number is high. So in other words, in infinite dimensions or when you just have a large coordination number and then it fails for one dimensional systems. So, mm -hmm. so even, even right there, um, that's, a, that's a very big difference between uh, DMRG and DMFT. Um, so I, what I would say, I guess, sort of just to add another sort of defining statement on it is, you know, uh, I, I, I guess, you know, since you're solving for the full wave function, you, you should in principle still have the entire self energy. There's no approximation on the, uh, uh, on the self energy of the system. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, they are a little bit different. Okay, thank you. I had a question myself. So here you focused mainly on the energy. Does it also work for other uh, properties? Or does then, do you uh, then have to do yes. the cutoff differently? Does, uh... Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, great question, actually. Um, uh, yeah, so, so the energy converges very, very rapidly. It's one of the first things to converge in a simulation. Um, if you want to get actual observables out of the system, it's very, very easy to do. And in fact, for the matrix product state, um, that gauge condition allows you to take local measurements very, very easily and much more efficiently than an exact diagonalization. It takes a little bit while longer for the algorithm to converge to a point where um, it is, uh, you know, converged to the point that you would trust those local observables, but it's not too long after. Um, the last thing to converge in the system, you know, out to as many digits as you want is the entanglement. And that's because the values that you're truncating on the bottom can somewhat affect the entanglement as you go along. But again, this doesn't take forever to converge in these algorithms. And generally, you get good local measurements and, and entanglements and, and things like this. Uh, yeah, so everything turns out to be fine. And if you need more resolution, you just increase the bond dimension. OK, thanks. There's a question by, by Rex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to help us get a more concrete um, understanding of the, uh, the application of DMRG to quantum chemistry. Sure. I wonder if you could just talk us through, let's suppose you have a, um, I don't know, a, a molecule or uh, an, a, an infinite um, um, one dimensional system of, 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 of N uh, electrons or something like that. Um, yeah. What's actually happening to the um, 
the many body wave function as you as you iterate the uh, the renormalization sure yeah so it's it's almost the same pictures in one dimension with a with a big caveat so in, in on the three dimensional molecule uh, you've now traced out some one dimensional path and this one dimensional path essentially makes it so that uh, you know, if, if you want to trace out the one dimensional path, then as you can see in the lower figure here, that there are long range bonds that appear. Um, so really it's in writing this matrix product operator that contains all of the physics, but none of the actual steps of the algorithm change once you've done this step. Um, now, since there's sort of a very complicated term here, the, uh, um, uh, uh, you might want to use an automatic generator of the matrix product operator, which can be done. Um, essentially, you think of all of the terms in the Hamiltonian as individual operators, sort of like those big Kronecker products that I had listed on uh, one of the first slides. And if you just take a direct sum of all of those and then perform a singular value decomposition to compress them, then you can generate this matrix product operator uh, for the entire chain. So once you have that, and then once you plug it into the DMRG algorithm, it's essentially the same. Now, how it's converging is probably the, the real answer for, for what's going on here. So um, it takes a long time for the wave function to actually settle into the proper ground state. And the reason is that, uh, you know, this problem should be hard to solve. You know, it's uh, in general, um, molecules and many body problems in, in three dimensions are QMA complete to solve, which is something, it's a complexity class that should not be solved easily on a classical computer. And it shouldn't, and, and unless there's, you know, the Millennium Prize can be won on this uh, uh, or not, uh, it, it shouldn't be easy to solve on a quantum computer either. So there is no polynomial time algorithm to solve these. So essentially what happens in the DMRG algorithm is, is that um, because there are all these long range bonds this truncation of the lowest uh, singular values uh, is only so good. So you know, if you've naturally encoded the problem that it has a long range interaction and you're now truncating for short range entangled products, you can see that there's sort of a tension here. So that means that you need to vastly increase the amount of the, the bond dimension that you keep so that you keep, you know, for example, in this two dimensional model, uh, if I go, instead of going down the chain, if I go one across, then that going one across there is a very long range bond, but it, it should look short range, but the, the representation that I have is not very good. Um, and so essentially what that means is that uh, I need to keep a lot more singular values in order for that sort of short range state to, to come all the way around uh, uh, in the singular value decomposition. So as you're converging to the ground state, you're often missing some of the entangled products that should be represented in the ground state. Um, the only other thing that I'll say about that is that uh, uh, this PEPS wave function would sort of solve this in two dimensions. In other words, all of the bonds appear local. So it's just a two dimensional generalization of the MPS and it's sort of complicated to implement, but it's very, very simple um, to do once you have. And so if you've written down the two dimensional wave function, everything appears short range. So the, the bond dimensions shrink down to four can be good enough where you might need a thousand with the MRG. Um, but there's other inefficiencies in, in, in the PEPs. Um, a three-dimensional tensor network has been somewhat attempted, um, but you know, again, this algorithm is polynomial time, and it should be difficult to apply on three-dimensional systems, as as everything should. Um, so that's essentially what's happening when you're when you're minimizing for these quantum chemistry systems is you're you're truncating off some of the short range entangled products, but they're actually they just appear long range in DMRG, and so it can take a lot longer to actually find which of the elements of the density matrix should be kept, and which you should be discarding. Thank you. So uh, just a quick follow up, sure. if, if I may. So yeah. um, if we compare. Uh, uh, DMRG with um, quantum Monte Carlo, let, let's say. Um, sure. What are the what are the pros and cons? What, um, what what is what is missing from DMRG, uh, or at least what is slow to converge, and, and what is missing from QMC? Sure. So there is. So if 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 we take a version of quantum Monte Carlo that's at finite temperature, just like variational quantum Monte Carlo, 
Uh, I, well, I, I think that's right. Uh, that's the type, you know, there's several different variations of, of Monte Carlo. Um, uh, it's at finite temperature. So um, there is an extension of DMRG to finite temperature. And this is sort of, you know, the right comparison between the two. Um, but the principal advantage of the tensor networks are that they have no sign problem. There's no, there's no frustration effects that appear here. Um, the other advantage of a tensor network is that uh, uh, it, it works a bit better on lattices that have this local entanglement. And it's also easier to compute the entanglement once you do. So having these, uh, having these things um, in the tensor network are very, very useful. Now, just so that, so that I say something nice about quantum Monte Carlo, um, the finite temperature comes out exactly and immediately. So this is very, very useful. The other thing is, is that you don't have this restriction on the amount of entanglement that you need to keep in your system. So solving higher dimensional systems is a lot, I would say, easier. Um, there are some indications that for highly frustrated lattices that the finite temperature algorithms can beat quantum Monte Carlo. Um, but I'm sure that if I said that and it was heard by someone, you know, and I'm thinking of some people in particular, I'm sure that they would get on my case for it. So um, I would say that, uh, uh, you know, it really depends on the problem you're looking at. It really depends on what your area of expertise is. I would say that there's not, you know, there are some obvious cases when Monte Carlo is better. And there's some obvious cases where DMRG is, would be better. Um, so I think understanding that the two different methods is, is very, very important in, under, in order to do it. Having said that, I do most of my, I do all of my research with tensor networks and I, I can go pretty far and calculate quite a bit of things. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I think it just depends on what, which type you wanna, you want to do. And I, I guess the other thing that I would say is, is that there are some brands of Monte, Quantum Monte Carlo that can be put onto a, a GPU. And I, I think the implementation there and the, the ease of doing this is a little bit easier with Quantum Monte Carlo than it is with uh, DMRG. Uh, in DMRG, you just parallelize the, uh, the, the linear algebra operations. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of taking a lot of different samples of the quantum wave function, at least right now, my opinion on that is that I think that that's just a little bit straight, more straightforward to implement uh, for quantum Monte Carlo. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I maybe just to finish, I have just one quick practical question. Uh, let's say that I now I have I have a computer code that does exact diagonalization. Can I then okay. link it up with some maybe your program or any other library that that's uh, does does it with DMRG instead? Yes. Um, do actually, in my library, there is a function that if you put in the wave function from exact diagonalization, it will convert it into an MPS. Uh, and in this this first uh, um, uh, French French paper on on D, on tensor networks, um, there's a, a like a tiny forty line program that takes any input wave function and converts it into an MPS. Um, so yes, you can. In directly input those. If you wanted to do the same thing with the Hamiltonian, you could perform these singular value decompositions to get the, the states, but there's also in my, in my library and several others, there's a, an automatic uh, generator of these matrix product operator expressions. Um, yes, I, I meant that of course I, you have the Hamiltonian in a certain basis and then give it to some program. Let's say that for the moment it's just a black box yeah. and does the DMRG. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, you can, it's directly importable. Uh, and what I will say about this paper that's going to come out in you know, this month is, is uh, uh, I, I'm sure that the journal will change this uh, title once it gets accepted, but the title will be Build Your Own Tensor Network Library, which I think is sort of the missing piece from the literature that uh, everybody sort of just presents theirs and says, hey, just use our code. But this is really meant to be a template for you to build your own and to, to do your own thing. So if you're interested in you know, making your own code, then, then hopefully this is a good template for that. Okay, okay, very nice. Okay, five past three, I think it's a good time to, to stop here. So thanks again, Thomas, for this very uh, pedagogic talk. Uh, thanks to everybody. So